All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. Today's a nice day for uh, for seeing some cool functions, or rather, not functions. You've got a high step if you go this way, or uh, walk around. You can move it if you want. It's fine. Yeah, okay. Today's a good day for seeing maybe some cool graphs that you've never looked at before. Um, but first, before we get into it, um, let's review what we've done so far. Maybe it'll go into focus, maybe not. So, uh, in previous sections of this, you know, 3.1, we started learning all about finding polynomial derivatives. And this was all founded on the fact that if you have a power function, so that's like some number times x raised to some power n, this is just easily done by taking that power down in front, multiplying it by the original thing, but then adjusting the power by 1 down. It's, for any power function, you can just do this. And uh, it, it's great because polynomials are just sums or differences of powers. So we can just take derivatives in, in a chain, right? Not to confuse the chain rule, but we take the derivative of the first term and add it to the derivative of the second term, and each of them is just done this way. Uh, but then this also applies, this rule also applies, to any real number. So maybe not even a whole number for n, it could be like one half or three halves or E, whatever it is, we can just take the power in front multiplied by the original term after adjusting the exponent down by 1. So this was 3.1. Also in 3.1, uh, this is probably the most of it. The, the next part also was the derivative of the natural exponential. So. We saw this one worked out in detail. It's just itself. In 3.2, we talked all about product and I think it was probably 3.2. Yes, product and quotient rules. I'm getting my numbers confused. What was three? Trig. Okay. Quotient rules. Section 3.1 roughly worked with how to take derivatives of sums of things. 3.2 roughly works with how to take derivatives of products of things or quotients of things. And so the rules are these. If you have one function times another and you want to take their derivative, then this is just the derivative of the first times the second added to the first times the derivative of the second. This relationship, this formula that we have here relates the slope of a product of functions, the slope of a product of functions, with the slopes of each individual function. The slope of the product has to deal with the slopes of the individual functions really what this is saying. And this is the exact way that it is determined. How do you find the slope, the derivative of a quotient? We did oh so many examples of these because all of 3.4, if I can just tack this on down here, which is trig derivatives, basically it's just this over and over and over again. Right, sine and cosine are kind of the standard two that we looked at, and then tangent is sine over cosine. Cotangent is cosine over sine. Secant is one over 
cosine, and cosecant is 1 over sine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this rule is a very, very important one for trig, and just in general. And does anyone remember it? Go ahead. Somebody has been working on their math. I think it's official. You, you've crossed the line into nerddom. Well done. Thank you for joining me. It's yeah. It's not many of us over here, but it's great. Water's fine. Perfect. You should have these rules down, by the way. Just like, as a as a should you have this or should you have these down? You should have these down. <laughs> so well done. And to everyone else who had that, but just wasn't saying it. Well done. Okay. This is a huge rule. Like I said, most trig derivatives come right out of it. I'm not going to write down a bunch of the trig derivatives. There's two really important ones that you should remember. Sine of x goes to cosine of x. Cosine of x is negative sine of x. From these and from the Pythagorean theorem, sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. You can pretty much find all the other trig derivatives that you'd ever care to find. Then in 3.5, 3.5, yeah. Did I skip a number? 1, 2, 3. Where did 3 go? 3. This is 3. You didn't feel right. <coughs> In 3.4, we looked at something called the chain rule. We know about derivatives of sums. We know about derivatives of products, derivatives of quotients. Some of those common quotients we deal with. Rational functions are also quotients we commonly deal with. And what about those other operations? Namely, what about derivatives of composition? When one function is the input to another function. Um, well, the chain rule gives us that. The chain rule says if you've got, oh, help me out. What's it, what was the inner function's name? Was it f or g? In the notes? G was the inner, like this. This is how we had it. Okay, it's all foggy to me. So f, g, if you have a function we call the outer, which takes another function as input, I call the inner. And this is a circle, not to be confused with a dot. This little circle is literally read of. You can think of it as a tiny o. And this derivative is the derivative of f composed with the inner times the derivative of the inner. We worked out lots of examples of that. From that, uh, we also expanded our knowledge of derivatives of exponentials, and that was the last and hardest example, right? Because there was a whole, whole bunch of these where we just identified the inner, identified the outer, and wrote down the derivative according to this formula. But there was one where it was really not obvious what the inner function was, what the outer function was. It was just any number b to the x power. I gave three, I think, as an example, but it could be any positive number except one. One's not really very interesting. And this did not come out to be the most natural thing. If you remember it, it was the natural log of b times b to the x. Now I put absolute values on B because the natural, bless you, the natural log can only have positive numbers input to it. 
and it is not strictly required that an exponential does have a positive base. You can have a negative base. In those situations, you need to correct it by doing this through the differentiation process. But in this class, we don't really deal with those too much. Maybe like in Calc 17, you'll deal with those things. So you can forget that for at least like at least one month. Okay. Today, you can tell we've been building up all these tools to differentiate things. Today, it, it, it really kind of gets just a little bit worse, actually. Not to be around the bush. For all of these functions that we've dealt with so far, polynomials, exponentials, trigonometric functions, etc., you could write down the rule. You could say y is a result of applying some rule to an input x. Right? And it, it, it's usually described like this. You know, for a polynomial, it's y is on the left, the rule is on the right of the equal sign, so polynomial x squared plus x plus 1, only y, only x's. How narrow-sighted of us. There are so many cool and very applicable functions or should I say expressions, where it doesn't have this. And what I mean by this is separability. Of variables. Separate, I think it's two ways. Someone can correct me later. What is a good example of an expression that's not even a function? But where you, upon trying to separate the variables, y is on one side, x is on the other, you, you have some difficulty, maybe with pluses and minuses. Do you remember a good example of something where, maybe I'll just, I'll just give it to you, that's, that's a terribly, poorly phrased question. Do you remember a non-function which has issues in separating, where you need to now consider multiple cases? Terribly phrased question. If not, that's fine. I don't expect it to. What about a circle? Is it separable? Yeah? <clears throat> we can move all the y's to one side and all the x's on the other. Can we find a rule for y, not y squared? Before you nod and say yes, I said a rule for y. The answer is no. squared minus x squared, or you have the negative root. A circle's a perfectly fine thing. It's just <clears throat> more or less. To describe it, you actually need two functions. Each of these pieces is itself a function. This is the top arc. This is a function which literally plots this piece out. This is a function which literally plots this piece out, and they connect at the ends. Okay. Today we deal with how you can take derivatives, and this is 3.5, I think, 
how you can take deriv derivatives of functions, sorry, expressions, I'm going to correct myself all day, expressions where there are multiple functions that can come out. Generally speaking, how you can take the derivative of a rule when you don't know the rule, but you know some relationship between an input and a rule. So this is called <coughs> implicit differentiation. Implicit. And this is a good initial example. Right away, when I write down the equation to that circle, it's kind of implied that there's some rule for plotting that circle, but there's some uncertainty as to which rule or which rules you need to look at. So if I give you some expression, involving x's and y's, it may not be obvious what the rule for y is. In that case, there is simply an implied rule. Given any expression involving x's and y's, it may be it may not be obvious from the expression what the rule for y is, but the expression does imply one. Right, subtlety. This is the subtlety of mathematics. I write down this expression. I can't say function because it's not. I write down this expression up here, and it's implied that there is possibly a set of rules which gives us what we're looking at, the circle there, but we don't know exactly which one it is. So this implicit differentiation is going to be a process, it's going to be a technique for finding derivatives of rules which you don't know. Process for finding rhythms of rules which you don't know. It may sound like walking in circles, <laughs> but it's magical. It's magical. It just works. So uh, we're going to start with a circle as our first example. We're going to move into some more complicated expressions, which um, you can't even write down the set of things for. Um, there's a funny story associated with one of them, um, with one mathematician thinking he was really smart and he could stump another mathematician, and the other mathematician just totally solved the question <laughs> really easily, and then the other one was kind of at a loss. Um, I guess ancient flexing is what it would be called nowadays, right? Um, but then I'll show you some really cool graphs because implicit rules, this stuff is really cool looking. <coughs> like parabolas, psh, polynomials, psh, exponentials, logarithms, sines, cosines, no. Implicit graphs, this is, this is where it's at. Yeah, this is really fun looking stuff. Um, yeah. Have you ever seen like the Batman graph? 
I'm not showing you that today. There's a Batman graph, like for the bat symbol, that is displayed up on the clouds when people are in trouble. You know what Batman is, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Who is Batman? Okay. There's a set of rules which together do not form a function which plot out the Batman symbol. Okay, so. So like I said, that's where it's at. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> Start with some expression or a circle. And our goal is to find the derivative of y, the derivative of the rule. All right, so y is some function, that's what we're hoping. Right? It's, it's like some function, and we want to take its derivative. Problem is we don't know what it is. So here we go. We're going to have to use the chain rule, actually, because what I see here is a chain of things happening. If I ask you to just right away take the derivative of this whole expression, you can take the derivative of the left side and take the derivative of the right side. So let's, let's do that. We've got derivative of 25 is Zero, very good. minus 1, which is 1. But what about this guy? Well, like I wrote here, y is a rule which uses the input x, but how it does it is unknown. So we, don't, we don't know what y does, but we know it depends on x. So this is not 0. Okay? y depends on x, so when we take the derivative with respect to x, this is not zero, necessarily. It's not uniformly zero. But I also see this as a chain rule. y is a rule. So is x squared. And what I, say, what I see here is this function is plugged into this function. And that's how we got y squared. Do you agree? I take this function, I compose it right into here, and that gives me y squared. What's the chain rule say for this type of thing? The chain rule says that we take the derivative of the outside function, 2x, we compose it with the original function, so it becomes 2y, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inner function, y prime. So this turns into 2x plus 2 times y to the 2 minus 1. That's the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function, which we don't know because we don't know the rule. Just still 0. Shoot. Um, I didn't understand how you determine what was the inner and the outer function. Right. So I look at what I've got right here, y squared. I look at 
what's inside the power and what is outside, right? So I think about what's happening. We're taking an input. Our input is y. The output is the square of that y. So the thing we start with, the thing that we put in, is y. What we're putting it into is that outer function. So in this instance, will, the, will they ever change the variable where you have to figure that out? Because I know variables get switched all the time. I mean, yeah, so like, um, uh, sideboard, I guess. We worked with a lot of things last time, right? Like sine of, cosine of x, uh, inner function got plugged into outer function. Mm -hmm. You're asking now. Like that. Yeah, that's that's kind of like that's kind of one of the underlying points of this lesson is if you know that something is just sort of like a vanilla um, variable, it doesn't depend on any other variables, then then it doesn't matter what it's called. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if it does depend on other variables, then it's not vanilla. It absolutely matters what it's called. Okay? Um, so, here, um, I'm here, I'm admitting this is not a variable. This is a rule. This is a kind of like an expression or a function which uses x's as its input and it gets out y. I could call it something different. Like Z, but then I'm just admitting Z is a rule which depends on the values of X. I can't tell you what that rule is, but it's something like that. Great questions. Other questions before I continue? I'm going to have to erase something here, I think. Questions yet? No? Okay. So, we've got that. I'll just rewrite it here. 2x plus 2y times y prime. That is not. So our goal is to find y prime. Can you find it? Can you solve this for y prime? Yeah. Absolutely. Subtract 2x over. Divide by 2y. And you've got it. here, and then this tells you the derivative. It's like another layer of obfuscation underneath, another layer of hiding the derivative underneath what's going on. So what's the point, right? What's the point? Well, as a function, Remember, the derivative is lots of things. It can be a number, which is a literal slope value. It can be a function, which tells you the slope at any point. Um, as a function, this has quite a lot of value. This tells me the slope for any point x comma y on the circle. For any point x comma y on the circle, 
Y prime is the slope, right? So what are some points on this circle? Uh, zero, five. Zero, five. That's a good one. So X is zero, Y is five. What's the slope there? Zero over five is zero. That makes a lot of sense because zero five is at the top of our circle. Here's zero five. And the tangent line there is a horizontal line, which has slope zero. What about here? Five, zero. Undefined, right? A, a line with undefined slope is vertical. Anywhere in between. How about this point? Three, four. It's going to be a negative slope. Something like this. This tells us it. At three, four, The tangent line, I'm missing y's here. y has slope 0, y has slope negative 3 over 4. We never once solved for the rule for y. Never once. Right? Never once. You don't necessarily need to be able to solve for that. If you have some input x, plug it in, see if you can find that y value. Maybe you're going to find multiple y values. But slope can just be found through this implicit differentiation process. And this process differentiates, let me use a different word, this process distinguishes, remember there's two functions, one on bottom and one on top, which when glued together give you the circle, right? These two functions give you the circle. This derivative respects, it separates out the derivatives. So there's this point 3, negative 4, and it correctly shows you the slope there is going to be negative 3 over negative 4, which is 3 fourths. This is the idea of implicit differentiation, right? There's a rule, we don't, what, don't yet know what it is, but we can perhaps find the slope of this expression without even knowing. Fantastic. What can I erase? I'll start over there. If you're still writing this stuff down, then you have a minute. Questions? telling you about earlier. Um, Descartes, Rene Descartes. Um, so he was working on some calculus stuff and he was studying this 
expression in particular, and he was utterly stumped, apparently. He couldn't find the slope of this thing at any point. This one looks, if you were to graph this, it looks like this. It kind of comes down, levels off here, and then kind of comes back out this way. But in between, it has a loop. This is called the folium of Descartes. Kind of got that eyedrop shape in the middle, or teardrop shape in the middle. So he, he couldn't find the derivative. He couldn't find the slope of this curve at any point x, y. So he got out his phone and texted another guy who's really famous, Pierre de Fermat. Pierre Fermat. 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 We're just going to leave it without the day. Pierre Fermat. Um, who is another mathematician. Uh, have, have you heard of Fermat? Fermat? No one. No one. Uh, how many of you could use a million dollars? Yeah, right? Okay. He, uh, he came up with a problem, kind of similar in shape to this. Powers of x, powers of y added together, equaling something or another. And he said he had a proof uh, of the equation, but he couldn't write it down in the margin of his notebook, so he just didn't write it down. Maybe this is ringing the bell, I don't know. This is called Fermat's Last Theorem. For a long time, people tried to prove what he had written down and said he could prove. It was a problem with importance and a problem that was so long-standing that this foundation called the Clay Institute of Mathematics decided they were going to put out a million dollar bounty on solving this problem. And Andrew Whale in the 90s solved it. Not early 2000s solved it. And uh, yeah, well, a million bucks he gave to uh, a charity. So. Decent guy. So if you still need a million bucks, there are six other million dollar bounty prizes out there for math problems. CIT, a C Clay Institute of Mathematics. You can look up some of those. Try your hand at solving them. Clay Institute. <laughs> uh, there are other lesser bounties out there in the world of math, but uh, those are the biggest ones. Anyway, so he gives them this problem, right? Descartes like, hey, solve this problem if you can. And uh, <laughs> Rene is like, I can't solve it. I bet you can't either. And uh, well, Fermat solved it like really, really quickly and easily. So it's kind of a fail. Here we go. We're going to do it. We'll see if we're like Fermat or like Descartes. But we're going to use the modern technology of calculus and implicit differentiation. When I look at this, I need to, again, remember that y is a rule. I could try my best to try and like separate out these two variables. But no matter what I do to both sides, these things are going to be like locked together, the x's and the y's. Even with like a computer and really good technology trying to solve this, the separation of these two is really complicated. This is a perfect application for implicit differentiation. We're just going to admit from the beginning that y is a rule, which depends on x. We're just going to say that's what it is, and we're going to move on, not worry about it at all. I see in this expression, which is not a function, fails the vertical line test, that there's a composition happening of y cubed, right? There's a composition where y is plugged into x cubed. Okay, so we 
plug in y to this, whatever that rule is, we plug it in, and that's what that second term is. And then I also see that 6x is multiplied by this rule on the right-hand side, right? The reason I'm writing these things down is because I'm, I'm going to make from these very explicit what we're going to do in finding this derivative. Because if there's ever something you don't know, you need to imply that there is a derivative that you don't know. So here we go. We're going to differentiate both sides, and our goal again is to find y prime. So we'll differentiate both sides. This is a very common first step. Differentiating the left, well, we have a sum, so we can just take the derivatives of the pieces. So this is 3x squared. I'm going to leave this for a second. On the right, oh boy, I'm going to leave that too. And I'm going to come to these. What's the derivative of y cubed? Well, that's a composition. It's the derivative of the outer function, 3 something squared, composed with the original thing that was plugged in, times the derivative of what was inside. <coughs> On the right hand side, 6x times y. Do we have a rule for products of functions? Products of rules? Absolutely. Product rule needs to be applied here. Derivative of 6x, that's our first function. Our second function, we're just saying is y. Derivative of f times g is derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. apply the chain rule here because y was plugged into another function x cubed. We have to apply the product rule here because we had a function 6x multiplied by another function or rule y. Just because we don't know what it is and can't write it down doesn't mean it's not something. So we need to apply this product rule. Now, from here, just like last time, this is usually the second question. Once you differentiate both sides, can you solve for y prime? Can you separate this guy? The answer is yes. We bring this over here or the other way around. We divide by things that we don't have, and here we go. So 3x squared. I'm going to bring the 6y over here. I'm going to bring the 3y squared y prime to the right side. There's a lot of movement happening in there. This stayed here. I just subtracted 6y to the left. This I subtracted to the right. And this stayed here. There's a y prime on both terms on the right side, so we factor it out.
questions about that? I haven't simplified entirely. I can divide out a three on both top and bottom and cancel those out, but this is pretty much it for this one. So now if I give you any point on the curve and you ask yourself, on this folium of Descartes, if I give you any point, any old point, and just ask you what's the slope, you take the x, y coordinate for this point, you plug them into here, and that's the slope. Plain and simple. Okay. There are some, what time is it, 12, 28? Oh my goodness, we're going really fast. Okay, pumping the brakes. No questions? This is good? Long and hard about that. We're good? Oh, maybe. Okay. Go. I see people shaking their heads. <clears throat> so let's break it down. Let me help you out. When you were given the expression before, the circle, the folium, what was the first thing we did? Okay, I wrote out some rules, yes. Okay, so I, what are some of the rules? We see composition, so we need to be worried about like chain rule, right? From the sine and the x times y. I see a product here, so I'm probably going to need to use the product rule at some point. Right? Okay. After that. What do we do? What do we do next? Take the derivative of each side with these guys in mind. So, so I guess step zero is study your function, expression, whatever. First, differentiate both sides. Second, attempt to isolate slash solve for y prime. That was always the second step. Differentiate both sides and then see if you can solve for y prime, adding and subtracting and dividing and multiplying things. So here we go. Derivative of three, nothing. Derivative of sine is cosine. cosine. So we write that and we keep the inside the same, but then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's just the chain rule applied to cosine, applied to sine of x times y. What's the derivative of x times y? Well, that's where the product rule comes in. Derivative of x times y plus the derivative of y times x. this out, distribute the cosine of xy to each piece, so we get y times cosine of xy, and we get plus x times y prime times cosine of xy. Good 
bring this to the left side and then divide by x cosine of xy. In fact, from the beginning I could have divided by x cosine of xy because it doesn't make much of a difference. What is the derivative of this guy? Someone say something. Other way around. With the negative sign. This is a product of things equaling zero. So either this is zero or this is zero. Yes? Can you explain how you got y over x? Sure. Sure. So we could answer the question up here earlier. That's what I was just getting at. So we see zero is a product of two things. Either this first piece is zero or this second piece is zero. Right. So this gives us some idea about where our derivative and function is going to be defined even. Where it is defined, where it's not defined, can kind of be indicative of where cosine is not zero. Because where cosine is zero, this whole thing is nothing. Okay, so when cosine is not zero, we have that this piece right here, y plus xy prime is equal to zero. So we bring the y over, becomes minus y. We divide by x to give us y prime. And this tells us now for any point on the graph where sine of x times y is exactly 3, this is the slope. And I, I admit I pulled a fast one on myself. But it didn't matter for the purposes of this problem. Brownie points to anyone who can see a mistake on the board. Hint, it's not on this side of the board. I see everybody looking over here. It's not here. Which input is sine equal to 3? None. There are no inputs which give you this equality. But if I change this to 1, there are very, very, very many xy coordinates which perhaps could give us this because the sign can actually take a value of 1. I just need to figure out what x and y need to be so that they multiply to be pi over 2. So that the sign of pi over 2 is 1. So now I start factoring pi over 2 into any pairing that I like. And those are all the xy coordinates that make this true. And those are the only xy coordinates for which these equations are true and the only coordinates for which I can find the derivative. From here, I'm going to attempt to boo and awe you with some graphs, but I'm going to stop the recording. So I'm just saying this out loud. Um, so that people are not like, what happened to the rest? Um, I'm just going to go through a few 
graphs of these guys and, and show you what these things can look like. And uh, maybe just, just for the purpose of opening your eyes, perhaps, to the world of these guys and the necessity for this type of process. Differentiate both sides, remembering that y is a function of x and you cannot just get rid of it. Uh, and then attempting to isolate or solve for y prime. In order to find a function for the derivative, even if you don't know the function that you started with, even if what you started with wasn't even a function, but just a rule or an expression. Okay, I'll stop here.